Uh, thanks, everyone, for allowing me the opportunity to share uh, some things with you today. Uh, kind of what I want to focus on is, is more of a process that we use to um, basically evaluate our aviation program and learn what we need to do next, uh, come up with ideas for where we can go and how we can address some things that uh, we identify as, as uh, needing improvement, uh, how we evaluate things along the way, and, and overall how we basically kind of manage the program as a whole. And really, it's, it's the, the aviation program is just an example. I think that one of the, uh, the nice things about, or at least for the, one of the things I hope you'll get out of this this morning is um, that this sort of basic process can be utilized in really any other program um, you know, that we offer as, as a service from, from a weather standpoint. And I, I hope to try to highlight that a little bit for you today. So we'll go with a little bit of background, make sure that uh, the computer is cooperating here. A little bit about our aviation program, and hopefully this will change in a second. We've got a pretty diverse program in that uh, we have a whole wide range of customers. We have uh, general aviation airports in our area, in other words, that are like recreational type aircraft uh, that moves up into uh, business type aircraft, um, corporate flights, that type of thing, flight instruction. Uh, right here at the airport that our office is located with, we actually have a an aviation program at the college that's next door. And so they're out flying uh, uh, touch and goes all the time uh, in circles. So we see uh, a lot of different range of users. And of course that caps off with commercial. And let me see, this hasn't actually advanced yet. So we have five uh, TAF airports. The TAF, for those of you who may not be aware, is basically a, a forecast for the airport. It's a very specific, it's a coded forecast, talks about ceilings, uh, cloud heights, coverage, uh, visibility, wind speed direction, and, and weather type basically over a 24 or 30 hour period. So we have five sites that we issue tasks for. Our two biggest sites in terms of operations uh, and traffic are O'Hare Airport, which is one of the busiest airports in the world, uh, Midway, and then O'Hare incidentally does have somewhere around 24, 2500 operations a day, so takeoffs and landings per day. Uh, so you can imagine how many per hour uh, we need to uh, get in and out of the airport on a daily basis. Uh, Midway is another busy airport. They have somewhere around 700 per day. And then our, our um, I guess our least trafficked airport is Gary Airport, which actually does has, have some scheduled service, but they're around 84 operations per day. And the, uh, we also have a DuPage Airport and a Rockford Airport that we issue tasks for. So it's a pretty, air, pretty busy area, uh, mostly because of O'Hare and Midway, but there's a lot of small airports in between that we don't issue tasks for. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, we also have the Chicago Tracon, in other words, the approach and departure airspace into the Chicago area, whether you're going to O'Hare, Midway, uh, or some of the smaller airports in between, and they average about a, one and a quarter million operations per year. So it is one of the busiest airspaces in the country and, and in, in the world for that matter. Uh, so there's a lot going on, and a lot of those operations are very weather sensitive. Um, we have a lot of flight clubs, experimental aircraft association chapters, flight schools, um, the FAA, of course, the airlines. Uh, we have a wide range of um, customer that uses some sort of weather information to plan their flights. Really, this is a prime example of the decision support services that we offer here in Chicago. Um, it's probably our most routine and our most regular and uh, one of the most critical, certainly. Um, we're talking decisions made on an hourly basis. So, and these things change from hour to hour, all day long sometimes. So. It's a very critical program. Uh, next slide, please. So it's been about three years, a little bit more than that, uh, when we decided, since we started to make a push in improving our aviation services. Uh, why did we want to do that? Well, it's directly related to our, our mission of the Weather Service. The first part of that is to preserve life and property. There's a safety factor. You know, flying around in aircraft in adverse weather uh, does pose some risks. There's also the enhancement of the national economy part of our, our mission, and basically this comes down to money, costs and delays, and the costs can be phenomenal uh, when there's weather. I had a, a power controller several years back tell me, this was probably five, six years ago, he basically told me that, yeah, it's about $70 per minute to run a routine uh, commercial flight. And he told me that if we can find ways to save every aircraft, you know, one minute, two minutes, three minutes, whatever it is, and we can do that all day long, you can think about the cost savings just from something simple that could be done over the course of a day when you're dealing with hundreds or maybe even thousands of flights. We'll talk more about the costs, but uh, they are pretty staggering. 
Ultimately, what we found is the FAA was not having its needs met, and we did not have a solid awareness or understanding of those needs. Next slide, please. So this is the basic process uh, that I want to describe, and this is kind of how we uh, sort of manage our, our aviation program. Uh, communication is a key piece of this. It's at the top. Uh, this doesn't necessarily always go in a nice circle because a lot of these components are, are actually intertwined, and I'll try to highlight that as we go along. But communication is the big one. Uh, you have to start somewhere, and then that also helps you move through your process of evaluation and, and improvement. Uh, so the next main step is to, uh, once you've identified maybe some problems or some, some things that do work well, you do some investigation and some brainstorm. You develop ideas, um, and then you come up with a way to implement those ideas. Once you come up with something new, maybe it's a particular product, uh, you have to know how to create that product on the forecaster end. And as important, if not even more important, you have to train your user on how to use that information. Uh, not everything that's available now is clear-cut and self-explanatory, uh, especially the tab. It's very ambiguous, and it's very open to interpretation. So you have to uh, address those, those shortcomings of some products, unfortunately. And then you have to evaluate, well, does this thing work or not? So not only just the product that you've, you've developed, but also the way you create it. Um, even the evaluation part, and one of the things I'll talk about that's really a, a big part of it, is you have to evaluate how the weather, what the weather does and how your forecast performs. So uh, you know, you have, the message has to be correct, but you also have to be uh, able to convey that message and make sure people are receiving that message and understanding it. So this is kind of the overall process that we're going to highlight through the rest of the slides. Next slide, please. Communication. Why is this so important? Well, A, you can learn who your customers are. Um, it's, it's pretty, it was kind of interesting to learn about all the different people using the different types of information for weather purposes. Um, the focus has been pretty heavily on the FAA in that they're another federal agency. We provide direct support to them. But of course, you have the airlines. You have, um, Air, airport operations groups, people who plow the snow. Uh, there's a wide range of customers that we found, and, and you may find some that you didn't even know about along the way. Uh, you need to gain an understanding of, of what their needs are. So just putting out the information without knowing why it's important uh, isn't exactly the best approach to things sometimes, especially in the world of aviation. And sometimes they're very detailed. I'll go through a few of these. Identify any problems and challenges. Uh, one of the things was that, you know, we could use more frequent tasks. So initially, tasks went out every six hours. Uh, then we made some changes and ultimately put them out every two hours. And we've made some further changes in that uh, we put them out every two hours, uh, basically during between 12Z and 0Z, because there really wasn't a need for that temporal resolution overnight. So we've reduced it back to three hours overnight, um, things like that. So how do you go about communicating? Well, you, you visit these people. Uh, Throughout this whole process, one of the key things is, is the human interaction part and really the relationship that gets built. Uh, you build some trust there, you build some buy-in, you build some exposure. Um, so visiting or at least talking in person is a good way to start that. Um, that's kind of how it started. Initially, we had several customer forums that we held where we would talk about, okay, how can we improve things or what are your needs and kind of get the different uh, the different parties together so they could also understand each other a little bit better. So sometimes it's not just a one-on-one -on -one thing. Uh, there may be multiple parties involved that can gain and have benefit from uh, knowing what the other is doing uh, as a group. Uh, workshops, internal workshops. Uh, a lot of what we do is based on uh, reviewing events. Um, Steve mentioned looking at some of the snow events in the previous presentation to evaluate their gridded performance. Uh, we do the same type of thing uh, with thunderstorm events, with IFR type events, snow events, whatever the case may be, whatever might be significant, we try to evaluate it a little bit more closely. And then we find best practices, or maybe there's some forecast tools we can develop. Um, basically, we train ourselves more uh, so that we're evolving as well as our services. Next slide, please. So I mentioned we visited uh, with the FAA. So we have several facilities that use the information. Uh, not just the towers at the airport, but I mentioned the TRACON, the approach and uh, departure airspace, and that moves out to the Air Route Traffic Control Center. So you're moving kind of from the local airport out to the approach and departure, and then out to the en route traffic uh, that goes through the region and ultimately across the country. Uh, they're all looking at weather information. They're all coordinating with each other because in a lot of ways what happens at, say, O'Hare 
dictates what those three entities have to do uh, in terms of planning. So it's important to make sure that you're reaching everybody. Airport operations groups, I mentioned them. Uh, in this case, uh, O'Hare City Operations with the City of Chicago, they manage snow removal. Well, if a runway isn't usable because it's snow covered, then obviously you can't, be, you can't land an aircraft on it. So they're working with the FAA, they're working with the airlines. Uh, of course, the airlines are involved in this mix as well. I mentioned some user forums. Uh, the first one is really kind of in, in more of an exploratory forum where we did a lot of learning. Um, we learned uh, kind of higher level general type stuff about what we need to do to our program to make it better fit the needs of the users. We followed up with that about a year or so later and that was a bit more nitty gritty about some specifics. We looked at a specific event that caused a lot of problems at the airport. We looked at it from each party's uh, perspective, the airlines, the different FAA facilities, the city operations, it was a snow event, uh, and what their challenges were and how we could possibly better address those in the future. Um, it's it involved kind of as a day-to-day -day thing, we have briefing calls and telecoms. We listen in on a national planning telecom every two hours to see uh, what the impact that the weather is having on operations not only locally but also uh, nationally and beyond. Um, we communicate with the different facilities. Uh, so you know, we write the tasks, they have questions about the tasks. So we've developed this kind of two-way communication when there's questions or challenges going on uh, where we may call the FA facility, they may call us. Uh, it's kind of building that relationship. Uh, we've improved our internal communication uh, between our office at the WFO here, which writes the tasks, and our Center Weather Service Unit Office, which directly supports the en route traffic uh, FAA facility. So they're all thinking about O'Hare, so we need to make sure we're on the same page. So from a forecast collaboration standpoint, it's also opened our eyes at the WFO to the CWSU world where they have a much better understanding or access of what traffic is doing and how it's being affected. So we've been able to really work together uh, to build our communication even internally. Next slide, please. So once you've kind of identified, uh, you've met with your customers and figured out who they are, uh, you can start addressing maybe some of the needs that they've, they've brought to you. Um, so you have to come up with ideas um, and develop some things. So it takes a little bit of action. Uh, it's, it's more than just talk. So you kind of do this based on what your customer says that they're looking for. Uh, so we need the task issued more frequently as an example. So how can we do that? Uh, address any problems or shortcomings that they identify. Uh, see if you can find some measurable goals. It's always good to be able to evaluate any changes that what you make uh, or even what you do routinely anyways, but find a way to do that. And that can sometimes be very difficult. I'll show you a couple examples of what we've been able to do. Maybe you need to run a prototype period. Uh, we have had basically this started with a, with a, a several week prototype period of issuing tasks more frequently and adjusting our staffing and, and how we run our operation here at the forecast office. Um, do things that fit within your ability um, in terms of products you can generate, you know, workload, that type of thing, but also find ways that maybe you can expand your abilities. So maybe you can shift things around. Maybe you can delete something. Um, you know, how can you, what can you do to make this work to address this need? Next slide, please. So once you've developed something, and I'll show you some examples to kind of drive this home a bit more. Um, you need to provide some training. As forecasters, we need to know how to do these things. Obviously, you know, issuing more frequent tasks is pretty straightforward, but another part of that was changing the way that we write our forecast discussion, including uh, specific bullet points about what our forecast concerns are for O'Hare and Midway, and then more directly and explicitly discussing our confidence level in, in our forecast. So that's something that, that you, know, you have to kind of work on, you have to kind of develop and, and train people on how to do. Uh, some other forecast products that I'll show you, we do uh, thunderstorm graphics, probability of thunderstorm graphics that we create. Uh, you need to train the forecaster how to do these. Um, it's not just the nuts and bolts and knobology of, okay, do this to get this. You also have to address, you know, the forecaster understanding of the weather. Um, you know, you have to advance meteorologically as well to make sure that the, this enhanced message you're delivering uh, is actually an accurate one. The other side of that is, and this is one of, of our focuses really over the past uh, year to two years or so, that is, is really kind of the critical piece, at least right now when we're still kind of evolving and we have some products like the TAS that are very open to interpretation. You have to train the user. 
um, you know, A, how to find this information, that was a big one. Um, it's available in a million different places, but how can you put it in one place perhaps? That was something we were able to do. What is this product trying to tell them? What are the limitations of this product? So maybe they've gone along with this expectation that they're going to see this in a product or it's going to tell them this, so they're going to be able to use it in a particular way, but really the product isn't designed for that, and you need to you know, make them aware of these things. Next slide, please. So our forecaster training. Uh, one of the things I'll talk about in a bit more detail in, in an upcoming slide is our event reviews. Um, I'll show you an example coming up. So I probably should have moved this later, but uh, we'll make it work. Um, we look at individual events. Maybe it's a thunderstorm event. Uh, maybe it's a snow event. Maybe it's an IFR ceiling, you know, sub 1,000 foot type ceiling event. Uh, we look at these. We pick apart the taps. We pick apart um, what we try to pick apart what we saw in the guidance. We try to pick apart the science side, but then we also try to identify the impact to the user. Um, and with all of this, and I'll go into that in just a second. Um, we need we can build training for the forecasters. So we have seasonal workshops. We talk about winter issues. We talk about summer issues. So twice a week, twice a year, we usually do these things. Uh, what best practices or lessons learned uh, from these events can we pass along and, and kind of build into our forecast process? Um, and as new things come up, like new ideas for, or new procedures or new products, obviously that includes training uh, that we need to present for the forecasters as well. Go ahead and click, please. This is just kind of one example of kind of one of the byproducts of our, our event reviews and, and this training that we tried to develop. Uh, these are actually steps that we outlined for thinking about thunderstorms. Uh, several years ago, there was a big push to reduce the amount of thunderstorm you put uh, amount of thunderstorms you put into a forecast uh, because it, it has an effect on the aircraft operation. It costs money and everything else. So what we were able to do through several years of, of basically looking at events, uh, we came up with a few simple steps. Uh, to evaluate how we look at thunderstorms and how we think about putting them into the forecast, uh, keeping things realistic. So, uh, for example, what's the forcing mechanism? Maybe we have a cold front coming. So we've been able to identify that typically with this, uh, one of our routine cold front passages, if you will, you might only have a couple hours of thunder. So try to keep the thunder to a limit. Um, you know, Try to hit the proper time with the proper duration. Uh, think about your confidence that thunder will actually occur. Do you have enough ingredients there? Or is it more of a hit or miss thing that, you know, there's a pretty high probability that it won't happen? Uh, basically, develop a thought process to help forecasters uh, better determine when we need to put something in the TAF or when we maybe don't. Um, the, the TAF is basically our only regulatory product. In other words, uh, there's rules and regulations that say when the TAF says this, you as an aircraft operator have to do this. So we need to be very cognizant of how, uh, what the effects of that is on any of our customers. Uh, next slide, please. Seems to be delayed. The, the next slide. User trainings next. It's up on my screen. Oh, it's not showing up on mine. That's all right. I've got a copy of it printed out for me here. Um, oh, there it is. Okay. All right. So user training. Um, again, this is a big part because the user has to know how to understand and use this information. Uh, we've done a lot of in-person training, and this is something that's really picked up in the past uh, year or two um, with traffic managers and dispatchers and airport operations folks. In other words, the people that are looking at the weather information, the products that we issue, and using it to make some sort of a decision. Uh, so we've, we've basically been able to try to do some seasonal training with at least some of these groups. Um, it can be very difficult uh, with getting everybody together, uh, time-wise, schedule-wise, cost-wise sometimes, but uh, you, you try to do it as best as you can. So the TRACON has been one of the big groups we've been able to work with on this, and it works out pretty well because they really are kind of the heart of a lot of the aircraft operation planning in the Chicago area. Um, they're also probably most product dependent, dependent because they don't have a weather person directly at their facility like the Air Route Center would with the CWSU. Um, so we provide a training, thunderstorm training. So here's how to use TAFs properly when thinking about thunderstorms. Here's other information that you can use alongside of it. Um, between us and the CWSU, we can address their specific needs based upon our access to them physically but also to uh, have an, an understanding of how they use this information on a day-in, day-out basis. 
we've kind of moved to recorded training. We started that last year so that these folks can access it at their leisure when they're able to. Um, and they also do work, you know, shift work as well. So it's very difficult to catch everybody. This also helps you raise awareness on available products, especially initially. Uh, there's things that people didn't have any idea were out there or they didn't know where to find them. Uh, so it's, that's a very simple thing that can be accomplished uh, by, you know, with a little bit of training, a little bit of communication. Um, what we try to do is basically highlight how to best use and interpret forecast products. If you could click one more, uh, you should have something that pops up. This was just a slide from one of our user training presentations that we did, uh, talking about how to best use the TAF. The TAF is very open to interpretation. It can tell you a lot, but it also tell you very little at the same time. So we provided some steps that they can try to use to get the most out of the TAF. And this kind of outlines that, the importance of looking at you know, successive TAF. So here's the TAF from two hours ago, the current TAF, et cetera. See what trends you can identify. Uh, also looking for one of the big things is using the TAF alongside our forecast discussion. Um, this is something that wasn't necessarily done before because a lot of people weren't aware we even put out an aviation forecast discussion. Uh, so these are the types of inroads that can be made. Next slide, please. So I, I've mentioned this several times, the post-event analysis or our event reviews. Um, this has really been kind of the sort of the, the foundation and the, the keystone of, of our program and, and where we've come from and, and ultimately where we go. Um, the things we want to get out of this are we want to understand how the forecast itself impacts our customers, uh, specifically the TAF because that is the regulatory piece of information that they use. So when the forecast says this, this is what they have to do. Uh, so we need to really be aware of that because values can be, you know, I'm looking at a 1,500-foot ceiling makes me do this, but a 1,600-foot ceiling doesn't kind of thing. So we have to make sure we're aware of those things and thinking of these things when we're actually creating the product. It also helps us to build an understanding of how the weather itself impacts customers. So, you know, we get quarter-mile snow at the airport for three hours. What happens as a result? Um, it helps us assess our forecast performance and our skills, so how well did we do. Um, you can find ways to uh, you know, measure your success. You may have specific metrics. Uh, we have stats on demand, uh, which kind of traditionally we've looked at sort of bulk stats, uh, like monthly probability of detection for IFR or false alarm rate, that type of thing. Um, you need to kind of move into the event-based realm to really get an understanding of where you can find your improvements and, and you also identify things that you already do well. Uh, evaluate if you're meeting customer needs. So does the information that you provided, uh, did it get to them? Did they use it properly? Maybe you put out the perfect forecast, but it was misinterpreted. Um, so there's a lot of information that you can glean from you know, post-event analysis uh, that can really uh, help you improve in the future and also make sure that people have the best information that they can possibly have. And, and some of the challenges of this are, though, Sometimes it's very difficult to get this after-event information in terms of from the FAA side or the airline side. Um, that's where communication comes in. That's where having kind of a, an effective relationship comes up, comes in because you can actually get access to, well, here are some decisions that we made. Here are some impacts that the weather actually had on, the, on our operation. Next slide, please. So here's an example of one of those uh, event reviews. Just it's. They're usually, uh, the, the part of it's usually about a page, and then we have a lot of other details like we post all the tasks, all the odds, uh, some other information. But we try to break it out into uh, things that we've learned. Uh, maybe there's a few bullets of you know, things that worked really well or some things that we need to identify uh, to work on in the future. We talk about uh, some of the key highlights of what was observed, uh, some of the high points or maybe low points of the tasks themselves. So at such and such a time, we put thunderstorms in. This gave us a lead time of you know 15 hours, whatever the case may be. We look at the operational highlights, we call them. Uh, this is basically what happened at the airport. So the weather did this. The airport had to do this. There were this many delays, that type of thing. And then it's kind of cut off at the bottom. But that kind of goes into our commentary. That's sort of, sort of our overview where we try to look at maybe a bit more of the science behind the event and then combine that with what worked well, maybe what we can address for next time. Um, so this is a singular event, but the other way to look at this too, and now that we have several years of, of these events, is to look back through all of them. And you, you kind of are able to develop this database of information or even conceptual models uh, where you start to see patterns in things. And that's kind of how we developed that thunderstorm forecast guidance that I, I showed earlier, the steps in place to think about thunder. 
that came from several years of events and seeing patterns, uh, building conceptual models and ultimately best practices for a forecast process. Next slide, please. All right. So that's sort of the, the process itself. Um, it's not just a one time through kind of thing. It's something that continues. So we've kind of gone through our steps. We started, we learned who our customer was. We maybe identified some, some products we could create or some changes to our service we could do. Uh, we've trained ourselves, we've trained the user, and now we're continuing to evaluate these changes as we look back at these events. So it doesn't just stop there. You, it's, it's a continuous process. You have to communicate some more. What have you found that could maybe work a little bit better? Or what has the customer found that really isn't working for them? And, and so on and so forth. So it's a continuous process. Next slide, please. All right, so we kind of covered this. Again, the foundation for this is really kind of looking at these, at these, these past events and then seeing how you can improve yourself, but also thinking about maybe what can be done differently for the customer. Um, like I said, this is really kind of the foundation for how we evaluate and really how we evolve. Next slide. Here's a couple examples of uh, kind of some things that we've made inroads on um, in terms of even forecast resources and other things. Uh, this is just a graphic that one of the C uh, CWSU forecasters came up with that shows us when the winds are in a certain range of direction, here's the operational configuration or the plan that the airport runs on. So if you're forecasting winds in such and such a range, well, this is probably the plan they're going to look for. Uh, the plan ultimately dictates how many aircraft can come and go over a given period of time, and ultimately if there's delays or diversions that need to occur. Um, so this is kind of one of those things that we found that has helped us um, through the communication with our user and even some of these event reviews that we were able to develop to help us continue and, and have a better awareness of what our, our aviation users are looking for. Um, so this is basically a forecast resource that came out of this process. Next slide. This here is just a, a capture of some of the guidelines we use for contacting facilities. Um, what we found is we didn't initially start with this. This was something about uh, that came through, you know, looking at these events and probably a few situations that maybe could have gone better, perhaps. Um, but general guidance for the forecaster that says, okay, we issue these tasks all the time, but there are certain situations where we probably need to alert the user because of the way their operation runs that we've made a change or that there's something significant that comes up. So basically, if there's some significant change that we know is going to affect their operation because maybe the ceiling is going to fall from 1,600 to 1,500 or something like that, or we now have snow showers that are developing, we think the visibility is going to get, go down below a mile um, in the short term, we'll alert them. And this basically gives the forecaster guidance on when they should do that to kind of keep things orderly, um, not to you know be a pest, so to speak, to the user, but also... Um, make sure that they're getting the information that they need because they do have a million other things going on. This has really been a, a, an, an important piece of our evolution as well because uh, once we started talking with these folks, uh, they started talking to us more, and this helped kind of build our communication. So it wasn't just us making phone calls saying, hey, you know, we've got these ceilings that are going to fall or maybe they're going to rise. It turned into them uh, calling us and say, hey, you know, I was looking at the latest path, but I've got a couple questions. Or how confident are you in that ceiling going down at this particular time? Or, you know, what do you think of this? Um, I'm seeing these observations out to the west. So it's really, this kind of really helped build uh, us initially contacting them, helped build a two-way communication that is, that continues and really is, is kind of, um, you know, made a lot of inroads in terms of the quality of the information and, and we've seen it in some of the decisions that they make as a result. Next slide. This was a, a web page that was initially set up at the start of this effort, and we talk about continuous improvement and evolution perhaps, perhaps need to make some changes. Uh, if you go ahead and click, we'll see that we found some, some shortcomings in the initial page, um, so we were able to make some modifications to something that uh, has basically the similar content but looks very different. Um, you know, there's certain functionality that people are looking for. Uh, there's certain technical capabilities that, that we have and we don't have uh, that we can that we can improve upon as we go through time. So what you start with may not be ultimately what you end with. Next slide, please. This uh, table, that this text product that we uh, hopefully see on your screen now is something that came out of an event review, but also one of these customer forums that we held, actually the second one, where we focused on a big snow event. 
uh, ultimately what we found was by looking back at these events and, and talking with our customers about how things went for them, we found that uh, it's not always the big snows that cause the problems, that a lot of the time it's the snowfall rate, how quickly it falls, uh, that creates more issues than just the total amount. Uh, we had an event, I think it was December 20th, 2010, if I remember correctly. Uh, we had about three inches of snow, but that came in about three hours. You know, three inches normally wouldn't be that big of a deal, but when it falls about an inch per hour, then it becomes a very big deal, especially when it's during the evening rush of traffic. So ultimately, until that point, uh, we never had any information that directly relayed our expectation of snow amounts over like an hourly period. Uh, you could imply it from visibility, but there aren't necessarily uh, routine direct correlations between the two. So, and we heard what the customers were saying about the issues that they encountered, and ultimately we developed this piece of information that was a simple table that shows hourly snowfall rate, uh, the, the general snow type, is it going to be a dry snow or a wet snow, uh, wind speed direction, things we already had, um, and a little bit of a discussion about it. And this is something that goes out three times a day during the winter period, and it's basically meant to be a single piece of information that the airport operations folks could use because they're doing the snow removal and planning when runways are going to have to be closed, uh, but also that the FAA and the airlines can use because they obviously rely on that same information. So it could be a single point of information uh, that they could use to coordinate all their operations together, uh, try, try to make the best of whatever the situation is. Next slide. So here's another example. Uh, this is one where we've actually been able to come up with a specific numbered metric. Uh, those are always nice to see. Uh, wind shifts. Uh, we have a lot of wind shifts at O'Hare, namely because of lake breeze. So they're about 10 or so miles inland from the lake, and sometimes the lake breeze gets there and shifts the winds the complete opposite direction. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, sometimes it just gets close. But that can result in a very big change in the airport operation and how they set things up. So basically, there was a concern that they expressed about having delays when they have to flip the airport around, basically, change the runways that are being used. So we were able to create a, a wind shift metric to track our detection of these wind shifts and also our lead time. Um, so I'll show you an example of that coming up. But that's just one example. So here's a problem that the customer has. You know, we've got these wind shift issues. Can you better address these? And we're like, okay, well, we can, we're now aware of that. What can we do? But also, how can we evaluate and verify that we are making some improvements. Um, some of the other things that we've come out with are, I mentioned this before, more frequent tasks and AFDs and these briefing calls. So just a few examples of some of these enhancements that we've been able to make. Uh, it really all started with some communication. Next slide. Here's just an example of some of those uh, wind shift metrics. Our pre-initiative period, uh, we had uh, basically, let's see, 22 missed wind shift events. And this was a period when we weren't really aware of what the wind shift consisted of. So how many degrees what they, were they looking for, what the direction range that caused them issues were. Uh, we didn't have the awareness. Post-initiative, um, a couple years' worth, and actually we just updated these the other day, and I, I, I have to look at them, actually. But uh, you go from basically 22 missed events to just a handful, and you look at the hours of lead time, uh, you know, basically a day in advance of some of these wind shifts and doing very well within the time frame. So just raising that awareness of what's important to them and making sure you address it from a weather perspective can have a huge impact on the ultimate result for their operation. Next slide, please. So just to kind of summarize, um, this is a continuous cycle. You, you have to start it, but you also have to keep going with it. Uh, communication is sort of the key aspect through all of these uh, different steps we've kind of outlined. Uh, it comes into play with certainly all of them. And basically, the bottom line of this is we've built more effective relationships with our, our users, and that's really what allows the process to continue. Next slide. So what is our evolution? Um, you know, we've done quite a bit, and it's, it's time that we kind of go to evaluation mode in some ways. We're hoping to have another customer forum here in the next month or two, hopefully, um, because that was very beneficial. We helped develop that winter precipita precipitation outlook. We've got uh, thunderstorm probability forecast graphics that we've been issuing. It's time we try to get some feedback on those. So we had a fairly quiet winter the first uh, year or two that we had this winter product out. Now we had a more active winter, so we can better evaluate it and see what the customers think about it, see where we can go with it. Same with thunderstorms. Um, we're considering on-site TRACON support for significant events. Uh, I mentioned that they seem to be the, the key planner in the overall Chicago operation. 
um, but they're also most remote in terms of getting that information. So are there, are there resources that we can kind of evaluate or, or make available to, uh, to help them out more directly when there are big events, to help things go more smoothly? Um, we have this big and growing database of event reviews that we have, and it's time to uh, look back through all of them and uh, you know, refine our best practices and develop and may, you know, improve ways for us to actually forecast. So we've, we've kind of had a, a, a heavy focus on the service over the past few years. In other words, getting the information, making sure people know how to use it. I think we're kind of at the point now where we can make a bigger push on the actual science side of it um, to ensure that our forecasts are what they need to be. And you know, that will really give us kind of a well-rounded uh, approach to this. Some of the other things we're looking at uh, that we heard Steve from Marquette talk about, uh, gridded aviation. Uh, one of the big things for you know, this could provide for us would be guidance for non-TAF airports. I mentioned our range of users from corporate traffic uh, to uh, general aviation, flight school type traffic, people that use airports that maybe don't even have a tower, but they still depend on the weather at those locations. Um, you know, the key for this is, is us, we're kind of at the starting point where we're starting to feel out what some other offices are doing and see what, you know, what our direct needs are. But ultimately it comes down to um, developing tools that can help us better utilize our conceptual models that we find in our event reviews because you'd be surprised at the number of things you can pick out, especially with a winter event. You have this type of event, maybe it's a panhandle hook, maybe it's an Alberta clipper. Here's what we typically see for visibility. Here's some things we can make adjustments to based on what we're seeing with this event. Uh, you know, it acts as a, an analog or a, a starting point uh, to help really help the airlines plan. And they're looking at this information more than a day out now to try to decide what they're going to do with their flights. Um, combining that conceptual model, what we know from the past, with what we can do from an analysis perspective, and maybe this means some improved or maybe a, a refocusing of efforts on you know, weather analysis. You know, it's very easy to get hung up in the model world but also be able to leverage these two things, these two elements or approaches combined with our ever-increasing numerical guidance capabilities. Um, you know, that certainly has strong and weak points that can certainly influence our forecast. Uh, it was interesting, uh, Dave Sills from Environment Canada gave a, a, a talk that mentioned this a couple weeks ago at our webinar for the future of, of the, uh, the Environment Canada forecast process. And, and the, this concept was something he highlighted and, and really rung with me sort of the idea of using the conceptual model with the guidance and having tools where the forecaster can have a better awareness but also combine all these things and use their expertise into something that can be very easily created. So uh, I think that's really what it's going to take for us to get into gridded aviation because um, we're talking about decisions that are made, geez, is the, are we going to be 1,000 feet or 900 feet? These are the phone calls we get. Are we going to be 350 degrees or 360 degrees on the wind? So we have to be very mindful of those uh, thresholds and the analysis part of it, but also be able to rely on some of this uh, high-resolution guidance that's becoming more and more available. The marine program, this is another big one um, that, that could really, I think, could benefit from this type of approach. And this is something that we're kind of uh, at the first steps of trying to do across the Great Lakes here, and so you may be hearing more about this. Um, that's really where we're going next, is this could be applied to any type of program that we have, the communication, the relationship building, and this continuous analysis from the service side, but also the science side, is really where we need to go. And these are just a few comments. Um, another metric of sorts, the customer satisfaction. What does the customer think of this themselves? And these are some, uh, some of the comments that have been relayed over the past couple years uh, to us based on our aviation uh, enhancement approach that we've taken. 